Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Stories Behind Products number five. Sleep apnea can cause people to feel tired and drowsy, and feeling a bit tired during the day may seem insignificant. However, sleep apnea can cause severe medical complications. And undiagnosed and untreated, sleep apnea has a high economic impact and endangers public safety. So my name is Oya Demirbelek, and I am a professor of industrial design at UNSW. I welcome you from the beautiful Bijikul country where I live and work and acknowledge the Bijikul people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay my respects to elders, both past and present. And today is a special day. It is the birthday of UNSW, the inaugural foundation day of the university's establishment in July 1949. So this evening, our presenters, Paul and Shannon from ResMed, will present the story of a sleep apnea mask. Uh, they designed the N3OI to make therapy more natural by providing the freedom to sleep in any position. And ResMed is a global leader in sleep technology that has its origins right here in Australia. And ResMed's goal is to provide people with the means to awaken their best and enjoy healthier living by promoting good sleep habits and creating awareness for sleep disorders like sleep apnea. So the presenters today and the presenters for our next stories behind products number six have been curated by Christina Zlomislich Brancaccio. Christina is one of our alumni um, and she works at ResMed as their director, product design, patient interface. So thank you, Christina. Our first presenter, Paul Derek Watson, graduated from Art Center College of Design, Pasadena, and has a, been a lead industrial designer at ResMed since uh, 2015, researching and designing for CPAP users' unmet needs. Paul has contributed to many designs and prototypes for ResMed, and before that, he was creative designer for General Motors. He later joined Evans and Sutherland Europe, then an industrial design firm called Design Initiative and has worked on transportation and product design projects in North America, Europe, and Asia for companies such as Ford, Chrysler, Fiat, Hyundai, Opel, Audi, Peterbilt, Volkswagen, Porsche, uh, and Philips. Paul has been a guest lecturer at the Art Center College of Design Europe, uh, the Scottsdale Museum of Modern Art, and adjunct professor at the California College of Arts in San Francisco. Our second presenter, Shannon Day, studied industrial design at Western Sydney University and began his industrial design career at Design Edge. It's a Sydney-based design consultancy. And with a decade of design and design management roles, Shannon designed and led many different projects for domestic and international clients in, uh, in areas such as office furniture, uh, electrical, consumer and lighting. Shannon joined ResMet in 2014 and has worked in technical and design management roles in many research and technology projects and product developments. Shannon currently leads the MASK design architecture team across Sydney and Singapore, and he plays a key role in the strategic development of ResMet's current future MASK portfolio. So I will now hand over to Paul and Shannon. Over to you both. Thank you. I think we'll share our screen now. I stop sharing, yep. Thank you, and we'll start the presentation. Thank you very much uh, for that great introduction. And um, thank you for allowing us the time to speak about our product. Again, um, hi, and uh, thanks. Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Paul. Uh, and I'm Shannon. Um, yeah, and, and today we're gonna, we're gonna talk you through uh, the story behind our, our N30i sleep apnea mask. Um, but I guess before we jump into um, and talk about the detail of, about the mask, um, we thought it'd be um, uh, good to sort of tell you a bit about what sleep apnea actually is and what these what these products do. So uh, to help you understand sleep apnea, there, there are three main types of, of sleep apnea. There's um, obstructive sleep apnea. That's the, the most common form that occurs when the throat muscles relax. 
um, there's there's central sleep apnea, um, which occurs when your brain doesn't send a proper signal to the muscles um, that control your breathing. And finally, there's complex sleep apnea, which occurs when someone has both obstructive and central sleep apnea. Uh, here, we'll, we'll just show you a, a short video that demonstrates what occurs during uh, a sleep apnea event. So you see that the muscles will relax in the upper airway. And what's important to note here is the chest is still trying to breathe, but it can't draw air in. Uh, a true apnea lasts a minimum of 10 seconds. But then the lack of air causes the person to wake up. This is, yeah, so this is what we call a, a obstructive sleep apnea. And these can happen anywhere between sort of five to 45 times you know, an hour, right? Yes, yes. So this is how we measure the advance. So just a quick brief history on, on ResMed, because the fascinating part, and I think is particularly for your students at the university, is that this really started at the University of Sydney uh, by Professor Colin Sullivan. Um, he developed the first prototypes were actually glued to someone's face and they used a, a pool pump, a, literally a pool pump, and to create the positive air pressure to keep the airway open at night. Um, this Professor Sullivan, he, he looked to scale and commercialize the technology. He finally crossed paths with, with Peter Farrell. Um, Peter Farrell went on to found ResMed and, and continued to develop uh, the CPAP product into a product that um, could really expand the use of CPAP and, and bring it to the world. This happened quite quickly, around a 10-year period. So, yeah, since then, you know, ResMed's gone on to deliver, um, well, gone on to deliver on this promise, I guess, of making CPAP masks, CPAP machines, um, in-home life support ventilators, um, more comfortable, quieter, and easy to use. Um, we're now around 30 years on 30 years from that sort of date. Yeah. Um, you know, working to help people um, with sleep apnea, COPD, and other chronic respiratory um, sort of um, illnesses, hopefully breathe and live a better sort of life. Um, Although we've made all these advances, there is so much room to innovate and design in this particular space. Okay, let's take a look at how we got to the product you, you see on the screen today. Yeah, so this is what we call our AirFit N30i um, mask. It's a what we call a nasal cradle mask. It delivers therapy um, from, a, from a flow generator through a tube um, down through what we call a, a conduit or a frame um, in, into the nostrils. The scale of the problem is huge. So let's start with the size of the problem, how, how big it is. Well, it's actually quite huge. Around 1 billion of the world's population is estimated to have obstructive sleep apnea, and with rates as high as 80% being undiagnosed. Yeah, that's, that's really no small problem, right? Um, yeah, and it's it's split across you know genders and ethnicities, and it's sort of it's a not not really a discriminatory sort of um, illness, right? So it's it, it's a fantastic uh, area for industrial designers to be in because this is such a big problem and affects so many people. Uh, yeah, I was going to say one of, one of the one of the many challenges we face, um, you know, with developing a product like this is you know. Producing a product that fits on all shapes, sizes, ethnicities, um, and ages. And I guess the key here is at scale, right, Paul? To do this at scale is extraordinary. I, when we deal with the anthropometrics, it's remarkable how different people's uh, face shapes and sizes are. An another sort of interesting challenge, I guess, um, when, we, when we design these products, products um, is meeting you know multiple regulations. We're a global company. We sort of a global um, a global um, audience, I guess. Um, 
And as our CPAP masks are classified as medical devices, um, we've got a fair few stringent and unique requirements that we have to meet. Um, so um, yeah, lo lots, of, lots of requirements. A lot of restrictions on a product like this, but that's one of the great challenges. So both Shannon and I are industrial designers, and so we've worked on a lot of products. And for some of the industrial design students watching, <clears throat> some of these products like, like cell phones or, or a mouse or a camera might, seem, might be quite familiar. And when you're working on these products, you, you have the opportunity to sort of hide a lot of the components. You can place them inside an enclosure. And you can you have some freedom to style the outside to make the surface smooth or to give it a shape or a design language while, while tucking away all the bosses and the ribs and the screws and whatnot that hold a product together. Yeah, there's a sort of certain freedom that comes with that, right? Being able to sort of hide those functional details and, and skin um, or skin and design form, right? Um, while, while being able to sort of those functions. Right, and th these are the sort of products that Shen and I certainly have worked on in the past. So our product doesn't really have an inside and an outside. Our, our form is also the function. The, the interface and the functional details make up the look and feel of our masks. Um, this is like many other wearable products. Um, people probably haven't seen our product before. So this makes it a bit of a greater challenge. Now, some of the products that are sort of similar would be eyeglasses or goggles or scuba, scuba wear or ski masks, where the designer has to attend to both the inside and the outside of the product. We have all the challenges of doing the inside and the outside of the product, but then trying to make the product familiar enough for people to use, <clears throat> even if they've never seen this product before. Yeah, and our interfaces become, you know, big parts of, you know, driving the form and the shape of our products, right? So you know, we spent a lot of time working on how, how do we how do we make those interfaces um, meet a form and a function that is familiar, sort of not stand out, and, and how do we, um, you know, on what sometimes is largely transparent devices, how do we make those almost invisible, right? Make it intuitive in a product that has, they've not seen before. Yeah. It's quite, that's quite a great design challenge. <laughs> this is a quick introduction to some of the ResMed family because the scale is so big. Now, this is not just our design uh, family right here. This is all the other um, people that need, are needed to make a product like this possible. We have the engineering and manufacturing and everything that goes into making a product like that. But this is a nice shot of, of where we work. Um, this is the innovation building and it's um, right in front of the river of innovation and across uh, this is actually our manufacturing site as well. So you can see that is a, a great big team that it takes to put together a product like this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess even before we start creating physical products or, um, you know, any sort of designs, um, you know, our, our designers and engineers strive to understand, you know, who they're designing for, what are the goals of the product going to be, you know, and I guess we, we strive to never forget that you know, we're designing for people. People are the center of um, what the outcome is. Um, you know, we truly do believe in sort of user-centric design here. Yeah, and it's not only that we're designing for people, we're designing for people that are gonna wear our product every night. Mm -hmm. So it is it is very intimate product. And we, we th this is always in the forefront when we're designing this product. So yeah, this is, this is I mean, this is the start of, I guess, any good design process, but definitely one, you know, one that we sort of use here is, is definitely making sure that we, we really understand these, these problems and, and what we're sort of going out to, to target. So we work closely with our marketing department to understand 
where and how a new product will will fit into the market and what the clinical critical requirements are that we need to think of in order to create a successful product. We, we sell our products in at a large scale. So um, it's important that we work together with all the other disciplines in our company. And this is where we'll have um, certain um, country specific regulations or certain, point, yeah. um, you know, country specific marketing regulations or, um, you know, clinical regulations or, um, you know, even down to what, what we need to do from a, you know, a road mapping point of view in our own portfolio. Right? Yeah. This is where we culminate and bring all those requirements together and sort of start to get a feel of what, um, what boundaries, I guess, we're starting to work in, right? Yeah, the healthcare requirements in each country is different. So we have a big scope uh, that we have to take into consideration as we're designing the product and understanding the requirement. So we, we definitely know that, that CPAP therapy, you know, it can restrict users from their normal bedtime routines. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not necessarily natural. Um, and, and, you know, most of us take that sort of natural sleep for granted. Um, so the challenge for the, you know, this product, the N30i, um, was really around designing a solution that would give people the freedom to sleep in any position. Um, something that generally, you know, had been taken away from them as they started to sort of get on their sleep apnea journey. So the goal for this product was really about that freedom um, and letting people sleep how they wanted or how they used to. So at this point in the process, we, we've established our, our primary goals. And this is uh, where we start to really dig in and, and start to ideate. We, we, we challenge ourselves to explore multiple concepts on a theme. So we have our theme, we know what we want to accomplish. And as a team, we work out potential products con concepts that will add additional value while solving our core challenges. Here's some initial early sketches of architectural exploration where different teams will try to come up with how do we best solve this problem and add value overall to the product. So I guess this is the this is the first stage of sort of sketching and, and working out what are the building blocks that we want to put into a product like this, I guess. And so we're referring to this here as, as architecture. Yeah, then we 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 further develop those 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 architecture sketches, right? And we we sort of look at um, you know ideating ideating details, adding finer um, functionality, um, working on specific parts of a mask. Um, now, again, these are some examples of some of our early sketches um, from some of our designers, you know, that were generated as part of that exploration phase of the project. I guess we were trying to work out what are some of the what are some of the nuances um, inside those architectures. Yeah. So at this point in in the journey, you know, it's possible that the designers might go off sort of on their own to some degree and start working up some ideas, and then eventually bring them back into the group. This is a simple one, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it, it might sound simple, but a whiteboard really is an important tool in, in our design process. Um, whiteboard discussions, and, and this is uh, pre-COVID, uh, th this was designed so you see people without masks. <laughs> um, we will bring in multiple disciplines. So there might be engineers who specifically know um, flow or uh, other other dynamics or structural engineering that we can we can bring the designers and engineers uh, and people uh, specialties in their area together on a whiteboard so this is a great way to work out ideas so it's something that we we do uh, here at resmed uh, we still work on a whiteboard when we can and yeah it's a big part of our sort of you know our diverge and converge sort of process right where yeah. You know, we'll uh, designers and engineers will go off and sort of diverge a bit, and then we'll all get together again and come back and sort of diverge on those ideas, get a bit of focus, and sort of run towards that what that next divergence looks like, right? Yeah. So it looks simple, but an important part of the process. Yeah, and I guess after sort of after those those that sort of conceptualizing, you know, this is when we start to 
take some things off the page. Um, and, we, and we start to bring those concepts to life, right? This is where we start to, you know, start to physically start prototyping things. Um, and I guess a, probably a, an important distinction here is, um, you know, we're yet to jump into CAD. We're yet to jump into anything sort of formal. We're still talking about really rough sketching ideas, thought bubbles, um, and now trying to do the same thing in a 3D form um, without spending too much time trying to, you know, design the detail, right? Yeah, a, a lot of students might find this surprising, but we're not at CAD at this point. And we actually do get together as a group. And we also have, often run workshops where we'll work together and, and quickly mock up three-dimensional uh, three dimensional sketches in a way. Um, this is important because this is a product you wear. Um, it's not something you hold in your hand. It, it actually physically has to be worn. So we're actually testing concepts at this at this point, we're actually building things. People are getting on sewing machines or cutting things up and actually seeing what things look like in three dimensions. And we've got a wide range of ways to do this, right? Um, but I mean, the, again, some of this might, again, sound a little bit obvious, right? But, you know, we jump in hands on, right? We've got plenty of existing parts and, you know, bits and pieces in our labs. We've got some really great facilities here at ResMed for sort of making some of this stuff and prototyping. Um, Prototyping labs and studios, um, but it really is getting in there and and just building some stuff, building some designs out of stuff that we have lying around. Right? Yeah, it, it's remarkable. You, you might think in this day and age, your your whole skill set is CAD, but but these these hand skills are still incredibly valuable, um, and this is how we are able to progress a design along. Even down to you know, there's a bit of an image there of a of a, a microscope, right? You know, some of these yeah. things are quite fine and, and, and fiddly, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely a skill we utilize a lot. Yeah, it's very skilled people here. Um, th this is a technique, <clears throat> we're kind of laughing because we call this cut and shut. So that is, um, we're creating a pneumatic splint. At some point, we have to shut the the hose, kind of speak, so to speak. We have to close. So we have to have to cut pieces apart and eventually glue or silicon them together to actually create something that is shut. Airtight. Airtight. Right? Airtight. Yeah. yeah. So we can start to see what, what it's going to do as a pneumatic system or, or a system that's going to provide air. Right? Yeah. yeah, we use, you know, um, heaps and heaps of different materials, right? Um, silicons, fabrics, plastics, um, you name it, we'll, we'll, we'll be playing around with it in the sort of prototyping phase, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's people here who are, are fantastic using a sewing machine, using cutting machines, and all these things come together as, as we're making a product. And a lot of experimentation happens at, at this point. Okay, so now if we have to mold something in silicon, Something that's a little harder to make than, than what we can make by hand, right? right. Once we sort of get to the detail where we've, we've gone as far as we can with the sort of, you know, cutting and shutting and, and gluing things together. Yeah. This is a fantastic technique. Um, we've actually, I think we've developed this quite well here at ResMed, where we will quickly cut up a, a three-dimensional mold. So we'll, we'll make a mold, we'll print it off uh, using a 3D printer, right? 3D printer, and we'll inject silicone into it. This allows us to get close to what uh, a silicon product might look like and how it might behave. Now, it's not as fine a detail as, as true, uh, true molding, but it starts to get us uh, into the ballpark and understand a bit more about the product that we're making. Yeah, and it allows us to do it in a rapid way, right, where we can, we can again, experiment with multiple shapes and sizes and, and details on these. Yeah, and um, it's not a terribly expensive way of doing it. We're not machining a tool. Yeah. Um, most of the people here can build this on the build it, knock it off on their CAD overnight, send it down to the printer, and we can start. And the next day, we can parts start shooting parts off them, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we we don't limit ourselves to one material. It, it's interesting as we're designing, we're almost kind of like making a, a collage of parts. Um, I, I find this fascinating because uh, I, I love art and, and various collaged artworks. 
But in a sense, um, we do that here just naturally by combining any material that we can use to start evolving our forms. The materials you'll be looking at here, you've got silicon and plastic, 3D printed parts. Um, yeah, and all these are put together uh, very early in, in our model making. Yeah, and it's 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 prototype for the thing we want to learn at the time, right? So again, the end product, these the, the the some of these images here you're looking at, the end product might be fully silicon, right? But for this point in the project, we were molding them out of rigid 3D printed materials, right? Yeah. Just to see how the parts were going to work and fit the head and and do things like that, right? So it's we we definitely use our prototyping depending on what we're trying to learn at the time, right? Yeah. Not necessarily what the product's going to look like at the end. Yeah, this this is this is a learning process, which is really one of the really tremendously enjoyable things uh, when we're designing here at ResMed. And this is another interesting one, right? So as we're creating things that we haven't done before, new shapes, new ways of doing things, um, we're also finding, you know, we have to do, we have to create jigs and fixtures and measurement tools to be able to actually prove or test or measure what we've created, right? So we're constantly building um, measuring devices or, you know, like so jigs and fixtures. To, Ways to of checking play with angles, things, right? things that, I mean, because we're, we're dealing with shapes that have never seen life before. We're completely inventing new shapes. And so often there's new tools required. So this is one of the things, uh, we have a lot of great people who can just think on their feet and, and create some of these terrific uh, ways of measuring and quantifying uh, the different things that we're making. Yeah, it's one of those things that you don't sort of always recognize as a designer is about some of these things you have to design around your product or things that you have to design to actually make your product come to life, right? Yeah, I'm always surprised at the creativity around here. Uh, some of the people that come up with these ideas, it, it's remarkable. And that, that makes it a, quite a lot of fun. When you, making a tool or something that you have no idea how you're going to measure this thing, someone comes up with this great idea. So that, that's a, a great part about this. Yeah, so as we sort of increase, increase the fidelity of our prototypes that we build, um, you know, we move on from those um, from those cut and shut parts, those um, 3D printed molds. Um, we really start getting into some of the CAD here, right? And um, um, we've got a great sort of in-house modeling um, lab where we can machine and make our own um, aluminium tools. Um, yeah, and, and it basically gives us that next level fidelity, right? Some of these, techn these techniques give us a, a better way to sort of feel how a production part's going to behave and perform. Right? Yeah, and th these are aluminum uh, tools, so they're not production tools, but you'll get the fidelity of a part will look will look like a production part, and then we can really start to understand uh, how these parts will operate and seal and feel. Um, so th this is a very important part of the process. Yeah, it just gives us that that as close to sort of a, a real part as we can get at this stage of the project. A level right? of confidence in the um, design at this stage. Yeah, we can start molding wall sections that are much, much thinner than what we can do on a sort of a cast or a 3D printed part, right? M much thinner. Those parts look simple. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> so as we move um, the design forward, um, we go through a process where we're these concepts are built up to, to, a, to a higher level of fidelity so that um, we can make decisions on, on a design that we truly feel is going to meet our goals. So this, this is an entire process of, of making a design decision. There's some winners and some losers, but the best design moves forward. Now that we have a, a proof of concept, the challenge now becomes how to scale this and how to scale this in many different ways. Um, yeah, so we've got a bit of a, a bit of a direction on what the product needs to look like as a system, um, but it's yet not going to fit the, the global population that we're trying to fit yeah. on, right? It's, it's um, what we were saying today, Paul, it's sort of, it fits a few, but it's not going to fit many yet, yeah. right? No. Um, so yeah, this this is where we start to really put the detail into what us what you know, our sizing strategy is going to look like. How many components are we going to have? Fit ranges, um, you know, all the other things that go into making a product, not just a single product, but an actual you know, 
yeah so, so even if even if the design is design direction is done and say okay this is the design now the whole second stage of the design work comes is getting this to fit on a wide range of people we like to think that we can fit everyone so we create what we call a fit range because we mass produce a product right, in, in the millions we we try to accommodate the entire population in in as few options as we can people don't want a million options they want to fit like you would in a, a clothing size in some ways small medium large it, it's like this to fit fit the entire population so we can really ramp up production on, on, on the volume that we need to to accommodate uh, the amount of people that we're trying to fit so this is beginning of the next stage of design. So in the past, um, you know, to work out what these fit ranges look like, we've we've physically had to measure and rely on sort of linear dimensions of facial features. Um, that, and that's, that's a big task. That yeah. was really time consuming. Yeah, and yeah. That, that was to that was to sort of work out yeah how, how these were going to fit. Today, we're fortunate enough to um, have technology where we can measure much more complex 3D facial scans. Um, there's a bit of a video they're playing on, um, which is a, just an example of how we can now, um, you know, in CAD, work out what different shapes, sizes, ethnicities look like, and we can walk between those and we can actually, um, you know, start designing towards these more complex shapes. Yeah, we'll get an early uh, indication of, of if, if uh, the fit range is working and how many cushions we need to fit the general population. Yeah. Okay, up until this point, um, we, ha we haven't discussed the headgear yet. And um, we, we use the term headgear. I, I don't know if it's really, a, it's, it's not a term commonly used, but this is, this is what we use in-house. Headgear is, it, it, it's really one of the most complex part of, of the entire system. It looks deceptively simple, but like many things in this particular area of design, it looks simple, but it can be incredibly complex. Um, the stability of the entire system really is dependent on the headgear. So we have to deal with the stretch of these materials, the, the range of fit sizes for these materials, um, the wear of these materials. We're using Velcro and how easy they are to use. And on top of all that, all of the colors and materials have to be biocompatible uh, to a much higher level than normal clothing because this is a medical device and some of the images there you can see so what again what looks like a sort of a simple shape there are so many ways you could go about that through ultrasonic welding stitching how you create um, splits in the in the straps so it's it's like like sort of paul said it's a it's a fairly complicated thing Although our goal is to make it look simple at the end of the day. Yeah, and as you look at you look at that little graphic and you think, oh, this is just a simple split. The the way these perform on on on, on people is very very different. So these minor differences in the size of these splits can make a huge difference in the stability and comfort uh, when people are wearing our products. And that's even down to the shapes, sort of in yes. those in those splits there, right? They do yeah. different things when you yeah. put them into a three D form on the head. Which means they'll do different things to the stability or how that's going to sit or not sit. Yeah, yeah, in the right position, right? Yeah, you, we're, we're showing this in the in the two D CAD essentially. But remember, this is a wraparound. This is a three dimensional product, uh, so you know, gauging its behavior is, is is quite a challenge. So, in, in order to to get the correct fit range and the maximum comfort. Even after we've developed a variety of prototypes of, of headgear, um, we have to make sure that they, they fit comfortable on all kinds of size and shapes of, of heads. So uh, we use this type of testing uh, to really get down to a fit range. We do a lot of this internally. So uh, for the designers here, um, we really live and breathe our product 
Um, everybody has to be, when you're working on a product, you, you need to fit it and try it and see how it performs. Experience it. Right? Experience it, yes. So it's, it's, it's a big part of designing a product like this is, is the experience of it. We do, we do so much testing internally to make sure that we're you know, heading in the right direction. Some of the, you know, the assumptions we're, we're putting down on paper you know, are true and correct. Um, you know, we're fitting what we think we're going to fit based on you know, our anthropometrics um, sort of data and, and does that back up to true life. Yeah. We're, we're um, showing a little graphic of a few of our people here, but believe me, there's many, many people are fitted on these before we, we can finally move to the final design on the headgear. Yeah. So at this point, we're starting to pull together a, a complete product. So this is, I guess this is more on that internal testing, right? So we, we're lucky enough to have actual, you know, um, <laughs> bedrooms here in, in our office, right? Where we can go and lay down on a bed and test these things out. So, I mean, this is a picture of me and one of our designers here, come on, doing, doing a test on N30, um, you know, before it was launched trying to figure out, you know, if it's going to seal, if it's going to move around. And, you know, we, we try to put it through its paces. We try to do things that people are, are going to do. People yeah. might not think they're going to do. Um, Will it remain efficacious? Will it still be delivering therapy even under all the different positions people sleep in? It, it's, a, it's a very interesting part of our jobs. It might be kind of unique to one of the things that's unique to ResMed, I think. Yeah, and to your point before, right? It's 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 something that we we expect all our designers to do, right? Is to, is to actually put themselves in the shoes of the person who's going to wear this, right? So where we can feel and see and touch, you know, what they're going to do, right? It's how you design a great product. It really is. You have to experience it. So once we have tested the headgear and the headgear sizing, we've targeted it down to the number of headgear that we need. We have a complete system. We've tested it internally in the bedroom test. Then we, we do internal testing for sizing to make sure that we're going to fit everybody. So I, we're, we're, we're able to show some of these uh, images. And uh, I'm just going to use uh, this to illustrate. Once we do the internal testing, we do, we do then move to external testing. Um, obviously, we're not going to show pictures of, of uh, people that were fitted um, for privacy reasons, uh, but and, uh, we do a tremendous amount of external. This is all before a product is released to uh, make sure that it fits on every possible ethnicity and size and, and age. And we, and we do this in market, right? So we do this both from a clinical perspective and from a, from a fitting pers perspective too, right? Um, so yeah, it, lots and lots and lots of testing um, just to, to make sure that again, this is going to be exactly what we say it's going to be. We are fortunate at ResMed. We have a very unique position is, is since we're kind of from art to part, we, um, we are sitting in the uh, innovation center at the moment. And, and literally, I can look across and we, we can see our manufacturing center, which is a lovely manufacturing center. We, we have that on site here, and, and we also have that in, in Singapore. So that photo on the right there, that's literally our view out of our, out of our office window every day. Mm -hmm. um, we can walk across that bridge and, and go and see this stuff being made. We can, it's, we can go in there and work on that development tooling. We can go in there and work on you know, all sorts of stuff throughout the process, right? But it's... It's such a, I guess, a, a direct and intimate connection to our manufacturing facilities. Um, and I think it's a real advantage for our designers. Right? I think, yeah, for designers to have that direct connection is extraordinary. Um, we, all, we always have to take the design for manufacturing into consideration. And having the manufacturing right here uh, makes that much more possible than in, in, if, if you don't have access to manufacturing. And and again, like so, whether that's ramping at the end of the production phase or you know experimenting at the beginning of the phase, right? That that factory and that facility and those expertise yeah. are there for us to to be able to use and call upon, right? Yeah. So we end with the, I guess we end with the product, right? Um, you know, we've had great success. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've had great success um, with this product in market. Um, 
I think it's more than more than two million products um, oh, in the market at the minute. It must be over ten million spare components that are um, sold as well. I think it's fair to say that you know, both Paul and I take we take great um, I mean great pride in how many lives we'll be able to touch with this product. Um, you know, hopefully helping them get a better night's sleep. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, we were also lucky enough to win a good design award for this for this product um, in the medical and scientific category. So um, yeah, it's been it's been great to see the sort of market react to it. It's been great um, to see something like this get to market after you know all the you know the hours and and um, hard work that the teams here put into it. Um, and it was a really fun thing to work on. Yeah, I, I, it's it's one of the very rewarding things is that we actually improve people's lives. It's one of the greatest things you can do as an industrial designer. So we're very proud about that. So we, we, we've talked today about, uh, about the story behind the N30i, um, but the end solution, uh, it, it's more than just one product. Um, it's part of a, a wider system that includes our AirSense 11 flow generator device and the uh, UX behind it. Um, I think and uh, Justin and Rowan uh, are going to dive into that um, in the next uh, behind the product session. Yeah, so hopefully they'll be able to give you a glimpse at what the rest of the ecosystem looks like. And you know, as Paul said, that's um, all of these things are used in, in combination um, to treat sleep apnea. Right? Um, it's not it's not one product alone. It's the it's the ecosystem of things that come together to sort of um, you know make the whole system make, make the whole system work. Yes. Well, yeah, I guess, yeah. That's, that's sort of. That's I guess that's where we're at too, right? Um, I guess we'd yeah, just like to say, thanks to the the guys at UMSW for um, um, giving us the opportunity to talk, and um, thanks for everyone listening to our story, and um, I guess we can throw it open to some Q and A. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, Let's thank you, Paul. Time. Thank you, Shannon. That was a great uh, insight into the the journey, <laughs> and uh, yeah, just to see everything that is involved. So. We are going to get the questions via the chat. Uh, I can see there's one question already there. While we're waiting for other questions, let's take that one first. It's from Miles Park. And he's asking about your uh, silicon uh, molds. And he says, um, when injecting silicon into sketch model 3D print tools, do you just use a low pressure hardware chalking gun? <laughs> Um, something like that, right? Yeah, it's it's yes, definitely low pressure. Um, uh, low pressure. You know, um, yeah, it's humorous. It's evolved. It's it's an incredible uh, process that has evolved. I don't think there's any trade secrets into that. You inject something into the mold. Um, there was a point where, in the very beginning, we actually would use a uh, a syringe, like a, a plastic syringe, and 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 press it down really hard. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's interesting. So the next question is from Mitchell Brooks, and he asks, what is the time from project kickoff to selling the product? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'd probably say, you know, typically it's, I don't know, anywhere from two to five years, depending on the project. Um, yeah, two years would be pretty quick, I think, for a product like this, yeah, but could um, be, yeah. It also depends on when you when you start the uh, start the clock too, right? Yeah. Um, do you start the clock at the concept selection, or you know, at the time when you're trying to figure out what the what the problem to solve is? Yeah. Um, it's not two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> somewhere along somewhere along yeah. those lines. So the next question is from Daniela Martinez, one of our staff members. She asks, and she says first, thank you so much. We are very lucky to hear the process behind this product. 3D sketches and mixed material mockups are something we really stress out to our students at UNSW. So how long would you spend on hand mockups or how many hand, handmade mockups would you make before moving into CAD? Oh, hundreds, 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 literally hundreds. We, um, we, we had a recent, we had a cleanup of, uh, we had to move out some older parts and you know, there are literally mountains of parts it's it's yes a lot a lot it there's no sense in limiting the creative process at that point um so much comes out of it yeah, yeah and we find it's you know it's it's much better to quickly build some low fidelity hand prototypes and build five or six of them in a, you know in a couple of days period yeah. or a time frame right than sort of spend a week on cad 
finding out that it's not quite what you wanted anyway. Yeah. Um, so we definitely, it's definitely something we, we put a lot of effort into here in, in our teams is to, you know, build those or well, have those skills of, you know, hand prototyping and, and yeah. sketching. And I, I would emphasize the, the sort of cross collaboration, like, is you just steal other people's ideas. You just always like, don't, you just look at an idea, somebody might throw the idea away and you might see some little germ in there that makes it possible. I, uh, some of the stuff is laughable, it, it's so silly, but someone can pick up that idea and, and really run with, run it. with it. Right. Yeah, it, I think we, we've got a bit of a term here, we call it borrowing with pride. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great term. And it's nice to hear the collaboration and how you, you use that at ResMed. Yeah. And uh, one more question, and then I have a question. So mm. the, the next question is from Matthias Eversheim. And he says, hi, in order to meet design standards all over the world, does the design of your product vary in different countries? Uh, we, we tend to try and create a product that we can we can have globally there are different requirements but i guess as part of our um as part of our i mean our great teams in regulatory and systems engineering we try to disseminate all of those requirements across um into a single set of requirements and design yeah. holistically within essentially all the requirements we have yeah there's certain i, I would say there's certain products are popular in certain countries the, yep. the, yeah one product that's really popular in one country might not be in another country so we, we do have quite a variety of, of products we do have a large portfolio and and yes yeah, certain certain it, they definitely gear towards certain countries will gravitate to certain products okay so my question uh, is about the testing and you've mentioned that you're doing and we saw the videos of the internal <laughs> testing which is great you have all these facilities and then you mentioned there's lots of user testing out outside afterwards mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Two questions actually how many would again be the question how many users do you need to test and the next question will be about the clinical trials how do you handle those ones yeah good question i how many do we need to test I, it mm. probably depends uh, um depends on the product on, on this particular product i yes. i don't know if, i don't know if i could remember how we, we tested so many people right yeah i i, I mean these are really large numbers um and, and I guess it, it's also we we test over the over the over the life cycle of the process too, right? So it's not a it's not a you know we get three years into the project and we decide to go out and test it. We're sort of testing in chunks as we go through um, and sort of validating and, and proving to ourselves what what that sort of looks like, right? Yeah, I like we wouldn't ex like uh, individually we wouldn't experience all of the testing that occurs. So I I don't think I can put a number on it. I don't know actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite large um but yeah this i guess the second one is the clinical trials um yeah they're they're a, um i guess a different a different test altogether um there will um we'll work with our clinical teams and we'll actually find um SMEs. smes or people with sleep apnea to go and try these things for longer periods of time right yeah. um and we have to do that with all sorts of ethics approvals and things like that because we're actually you know affecting people and, and so yeah. sme would be a subject matter, matter experts. experts yeah yes it's interesting I, i'm a to... subject matter expert yeah? actually because yeah because I, I use I, you, I use one yes mm -hmm. uh, for 16 years i i did not see but in fact when i uh, getting a job at, at resmed I, I i contacted and said i i could do a better job designing those things <laughs> And they said, oh, yeah, OK, give it a try. So we, we invited Paul in. It's been amazing. <laughs> well, you definitely can. Um, one more question. Mark Bertinetti is asking the question. Great talk, guys. He says, uh, really well delivered. And he also adds, when I worked at ResMed, I was told I was crazy when I proposed moving the sw swivel to the top of the head in 2205. <laughs> As they said, the air would get pinched by the side tube and it would be too bulky. But you guys made it work and have brought it to life. Congratulations. It's a great product. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Yeah. And you know, like like we said, nothing's crazy, right? There's no. always a there's a workable solution in a lot of things, right? It's yeah. just the right time, right place, yeah. right momentum. Uh, re referencing back to the person asking about the silicon molds, you, you do have to make sure there are vent ports when you put the pressure on just there's a tip for you 
when you inject the silicon. <laughs> Great, thank you for the tip. One more question from Mariano Ramirez. He says, thanks, Paul and Shannon. Was the end of life and sustainability of these masks part of the brief? Some ResMed hospital masks are disposable due to uh, single patient use and prevent contamination. Is there any system for collecting used masks for recycling and material recovery? Yeah, it's wow. a good question. Um, it's the medical world, such a tough industry on that. Um, it's definitely a changing landscape. The sustainability is something that we're bringing more and more into, I guess, a design process. There, there are several uh, projects running currently on, on, on how to do that, how to recycle and, and how to minimize the waste. Yes. Um, but this particular product, so it's designed so it can be sort of um, what we call um, clean between uses. Um, so in some some clinics or some labs, you, um, you are able to sort of disinfect and, and clean and, and reuse these masks. Yeah, the MPMU version, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that brought us to our last question. I'm just uh, looking and trying to see if there are any more questions, but no. So I think we have now to wrap up. I'll just thank you so much again, Paul and Shannon. It was amazing to see this incredible behind the scenes stories. A uh, heartfelt thank you. And I and you also already mentioned the next talk for the number six, which is in three weeks. So uh, thank you again for generously sharing this journey. And to all the attendees that joined us this evening, thank you all uh, for joining us because you made the evening even more special. But before you leave, I just want to show you again the talk that will be in three weeks. So put it in your calendars. We'll have Justin Formica and Rowan Follum presenting from ResMed and again curated by Christina Zlomislich. Francaccio, thank you, Christina. Thank you all very much again. Uh, stay tuned for the invitations for our next event. And until then, stay safe and well. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>